Nova is a city of mixed identities. A former Roman fort turned into a Gothic town before switching between the Romans, the Gale, the Goths, and even the Danes a time or two. It is reflected in the architecture, the food, the art, the language, and even the way people celebrate their holidays. In Nova, you can buy Saturnalia wine before going down the street to pick up a tree, and then get pictures with Yule cats, elves, Tom Tay, Father Christmas, Saturn, Odin, and Jesus of Nazareth, Mary Lloyd, or even Odin's horse. Or at least costumed actors pretending to be them, but the spirit lived on, and it is enjoyed in modern Nova traditions mingling with each other, so families may be celebrating in unique ways that they don't think about the source of where it came, comes from. Nova looked very different a century and a quarter ago. At that time, it was an industrial city of growing industrial strength and also growing danger. At that time, the snow that fell was gray with coal, the factories worked six days a week, and holidays were an extreme rarity for anyone, so many traditions were left behind. Not forgotten, but put away as families did their best to make through the harsh industrial winters. During these times, industry was king. Full-time work was for the whole family. It was a rough time to be a child. Infant mortality skyrocketed, working while pregnant around dangerous chemicals, industrial accidents, and, or even good old-fashioned dangerous people could wipe out entire families during the industrial age. Nova at that this time had a lot of disappearances leading up to the new year. After the new year, deaths dropped dramatically, factories often shut down for weekends, and people had reason for cheer again. What led to this? New labor laws certainly helped. Union membership had a hand, new technology that was safer, and even mandatory schooling for everyone below the age of 17 had a large part of improving the situation in Nova. However, there is a common urban legend in Nova that the locals attribute to the sudden drop of death in Nova. While the urban legend certainly has roots in what did happen, it was proven difficult to untangle truth from legend. So here I have a story collected from newspaper archives, or modern urban legends, or even variations of the legend throughout the decades. What it is the core of it all, that a mixture of traditions and legends have created something new, while also being something very old at the same time, which is in a way how all stories like these work. Henry Krauser was a very wealthy factory owner. He owned three different factories in Nova and had his own ship. The son of a minor goth noble and a Swamp City industrialist, hence his unique name, he brought wealth from both sides of Oceanus to his factories, he bought the greatest of machines, and he paid the best out of all the factory owners in Nova. He would, however, prove to be as cruel as he was clever, pushing both his machines and his employees harder than anyone else. He would lock all the doors during work hours so employees couldn't, wouldn't leave on smoke breaks. When a fire broke out in one of his factories, since no one could leave due to all the doors being locked, it was said he would send guards to the neighboring factories to keep them working. Even as those workers heard the screams of the dying, he would refuse to call the fire brigade and force employees to keep working, even as they feared for their lives. After the initial factory fire, there was a large strike until he improved the safety of his factories, and Krauser took immediate action by employing only orphans and widows for his most dangerous tasks. He believed that if he only employed people that had no family left for dangerous tasks, there would be no complaint about their inevitable injury or fatality. He believed in his right to money and the right to endless growth. As December started to come to a close, his workers begged to have the 25th off. Quite a few of his orphans and widowed workers were Christian or lived in Christian orphanages and workhouses. They wanted the day off to celebrate and rest, while Krauser, ostensibly, celebrated Saturnalia. He gave his employees no days off, with the exception of Sunday, 
He didn't even give himself a day off from counting his capital and his coins. Both Christmas Eve and Christmas both fell on a Friday and Saturday that year, respectively. So while most of Nova stopped, or at least slowed down from December 21st to January 1st, Krauser's factories only sped up as he wanted to increase his inventory. His sales to Albion, the Southern Cities, the Middle Kingdom, and even Gaul all had proven very profitable that year, and he knew that demand would surge again after January 1st, so even by his standards, he took shortcuts. He had children fix machines while they kept working. He had people work through their lunches and supper, working nearly to the bone, oftentimes letting blood mix with the fiber, letting human bones smelt it with the steel, and letting human tears brine the pork. Anything, as long as he made his money. One night, on Christmas Eve, he had two deaths in his factory. A young boy and a young girl, both suffocated in an oven. In some stories, they are siblings. In others, they are friends. But the earliest story doesn't mention any relationship, just to mention that they both possess a single golden eye each, a fact that is not repeated in modern retellings. They were orphans, and no one was responsible for them, except the orphanage itself, which was the property of Krauser. Ah yes, that was another cruelty of Krauser. He didn't merely employ widows and orphans from workhouses and orphanages, he owned those very houses. He owned the soup kitchens in the city, he owned the charities, he owned the homeless shelters, and he owned the factories. This gave him a place to find new workers, but also meant he knew how to quietly make people disappear. If someone who lived in a homeless shelter five days in a row, and on the sixth day in the row disappears, they may have been killed, or they may have quit, or they have, may have found a home. If an orphan disappeared, and if anyone did ask about it, it would, was really easy to produce paperwork showing they got adopted by a distant relative or even a friendly family. Someone got ill, he owned the factory, and it was either his charity that would foot the bill, or he would stick them with unpayable debt. The churches and temples? He patronized them all, and his donations kept them open. So even if they weren't directly controlled by him, they did not want to bite the hand that fed them. He was practically untouchable, and these deaths were going to be more of the same. He could give and take away at will, and he would often take, and he would only give, when giving would cause more pain than taking. However, because it was Christmas Eve, Henry Krauser could not get rid of the children's body in a normal manner. In that day and age, physicians, doctors, and medical students needed fresh bodies to study. Medical science was not new, but anatomy certainly was still an infant science. Rarer bodies like children, those were worth even more especially if they could get it without legal trouble. However, even those morbid services took pause for the winter holiday, so Krauser could not find a grim man to sell the corpses for, and he was not willing to pay a single copper to send them to the pauper's graveyard. He could still make money from their corpses. He would just be clever. He stored their bodies in large casks, then stored those casks inside large ice boxes used in the meat packing factory, so they could still be fresh. On the 27th, when the Grim Men would take the corpses away. However, there was a mix up at the meat packing plant. Some say it was a genuine mistake, others say that it was done on purpose. But regardless of which was true, what was known was that the casks were emptied into a large grinder to make, be made into sausage. How it was not noticed was not known. Some say that the workers were too tired to notice. Others say the workers had disposed of human bodies like this before. And the earliest version of the story said that it was done that way 
because no one bothered to ever check to see how the sausage was made. That night on Christmas Eve, mere hours after the children were suffocated, their bodies were salted and then ground into sausage, the very same sausage that was fed to Krauser's employees that night, including Krauser himself. No one knew of Krauser's crimes, but as midnight approached, people waited with bated breath. For the stroke of midnight and the hope of a midnight visitor, even as an adult, the traditions and hopes and dreams that shape you have an impact as an adult. Some workers still did find small things out of hope of a miracle. They left shoes out, hoping to find new coins in them. They hoped for gifts underneath their trees, or that their drying stockings would have gifts in them. Even in places as dark and grim as this factory, hope persisted and it was fed. In the workhouses, small gifts were often exchanged and small items made their way in. Sometimes it was from the others, but it was still a great kindness. Sometimes it was a gift from a church or a charity who wanted to bring happiness to Nova. And sometimes no one knew where the gifts came from, surely. But everyone had their hopes and hearts still lit by, a flicker, by that flicker of proof in their hard lives. What no one expected was for something to visit the factories. All of the factories on the same night, all within the same few hours between midnight and 4 a.m. During those four hours, power, steam, and heat was no longer available to the factory. No matter how hard people tried to shovel coal into the fire, the fire wouldn't burn. No one could leave the factory because the blizzard outside got so bad that anyone who tried to leave would freeze solid mere steps away from the doors. The telegram and the newly added telephones didn't get any useful responses. The telegram would only tap in a tune of a hymn. The telephone would only ask them questions like, Have you been nice or have you been naughty? I see you. I know what you've done. And most disturbingly, He's coming to town. No answers seemed to get any useful response. The machines couldn't work, no matter how much Krauser's men tried to make them work. People grew cold, being unable to start fires, and huddled up in the darkness as the next part of their nightmare began. The tales vary. Some stories tell of small elves hopping from shadow to shadow clad in haunting masks that looked like twisted variations of the 13 Yule brothers. These elves would haul random people into the darkness, screaming, never to be found again, not even a body left behind. Others tell of eight skeletal horses with many bells and ribbons that rode through the blizzard, circling the factory and speaking with the voices of seductive women with Kim Ru accents. They would speak in rhyming couplets. The night is cold, lonely, and with gloom. Let us in and we will warm our bones. Would be a common one that was said, and if a horse was brought in, sometimes they would open their mouths and drop small trinkets into a worker's hands and other times they would knock ash onto the worker. Those that were ashed would soon die. None of them survived to see the new year. Others still told of hearing boots on the roof and a heavy sled with bells and reindeer hoofs. And after hearing those steps, soon someone would descend from the industrial chimney, even if they had no way to possibly enter. And even in the tales that tell of the Christmas man, they vary wildly. Some tell of a jovial, rosy-cheeked man dressed as in a warm red cloak with a fat belly, white bushy beard, and a large sack behind him, giving small wrapped presents to the workers and to the factory guards. He would leave them only a small piece of coal. 
the only coal that would burn that night to keep them warm. Others tell of a Christmas man dressed in blue, and he too was bearded, and he smiled. However, he was not fat, but well-muscled as a warrior, carrying with him a spear and two crows that spoke in tongues that dared anyone to get close. One eye was covered, and the other was as cold as the blizzard outside. He too left gifts for the workers, gifts that would bring joy to those that it was given to, and it would bring grief to those that took them. And yet others told of a Christmas man that wasn't a man at all, but far closer to a bipedal goat, nearly three meters tall, yellow goat eyes, a mouth that bleated often, and whose fur stank like a barnyard, a cruel creature that carried a cage on its back and a bundle of sticks in its right hand, which it would use to inflict red marks on some, and for others, they were stuck inside the cage on its back. When it took enough, it dragged them away as it crawled up the chimney. The oldest story, the story shared by the secretary of Krauser mere days after the event, and the one I am inclined to believe differed the furthest from everyone else's in every telling. The secretary told of a man walking in from the blizzard, a man with a white beard, black leather, and with a cane of bone and a leather necklace with a bird's skull on it. When the man walked in from the storm, he grabbed the workers by the necks, one by one, and he would smell their breath. If he didn't like what he smelled, he would let them go. If, however, he liked what he smelled, he would smile, a smile that was as cruel as it was wide, and the winter man would produce a knife and slice at the stomach of the one he smelled, and he would store their stomach in a sack he carried behind him. Nothing anyone tried to do to kill the man would work. Any who tried to stab him, bludgeon him, or even shoot him would be grabbed by him, and they would have their necks slit whether or not he took their stomach. Those who ran froze in the blizzard, and he would take their stomachs anyway. Even those who hid, he was able to find. Any lucky blow or trap that managed to hit him didn't so much as slow down this old winter man. By the time he made his way to my office, he smelled my breath and tossed me aside. I faced through the office doors as he opened them, and Mr. Krauser fired a blunderbuss directly at the old man. The old man didn't even blink. He stepped forward as Mr. Krauser struggled to reload, and the old man smelled Mr. Krauser's breath before he slashed Mr. Krauser's stomach and removed it. Satisfied with his sack, the old man took some of Mr. Krauser's blood as he inscribed a rune of dark magic on the ground. I have seen many dark things in my life. I have seen people appeal to Hades, Pluto's, Hell, Pandemonium, Loki, Odin, even appeal to the demons themselves in darkness. And this was darker still. Runes that didn't match anything I knew, and he laid his sack in the middle as he spoke, not caring about this witness. On this dark day, we bring light. On this night of death, we bring life. In this place of suffering, we bring joy. He said as the sack shook, and from the sack, two young children arose. Children covered in blood, brine, and bile, but they lived. Children who looked a little similar, but only because they both had one golden eye. The girl had her golden eye on the left, and the boy on his right. The cruel winter man laid his staff down, and he reached out both of his hands, removing both of the children's golden eyes. Not thinking, I ran forward to tackle him to the ground. He fell, but not before taking the children's eyes. When he grabbed his staff, he vanished into snow and ash, leaving me alone with the children as power was restored to the factories. Mr. Krauser was dead, and I was now left alone. 
to care for two young children. Thankfully, I was able to take care of them until help could arrive, and I am already in the process of adopting them. The boy is Dexter, and the girl is Sinestra. They shared their story with me about how they suffocated in the ovens, and how they remembered their bodies being moved into dark casks that grew cold before being filled with brine and then ground up in meat. They were aware of it all, feeling all of that pain, and they suffered because of it. Mr. Krauser was cold and cruel to them, and I am certain and that I am certain of. However, with all of the tales going around town, people believed that there was some kind of justice done here. People saying that the Christmas man brought these children back to life as a kindness. People saying Odin brought them back and took an eye as payment. And even a few who said Krampus brought them back. However, they are all quite certain that whatever happened, it was done as a cosmic balance of naughty and nice. However, that man from the blizzard was not a good man. He did not leave some alive out of kindness. He didn't only gut the naughty ones. He gut those that had children's sausages inside of them. It just happened to mostly be Krauser's guards because the guards get the best food. He didn't kill Krauser for being cruel, and he didn't bring the children back because he was kind. There's hundreds of dead employees every year, and no one stood up for them. He didn't bring everyone back. He brought back these two. He killed anyone who was in his way. He only brought them back because he needed their eyes. What for? I do not know. What I do know is that people are sharing the tale as a tale of cosmic justice and not seeing it for what it is. Someone wanted something, and they got it. They didn't care about naughty nor nice. They didn't care about goodness for goodness sakes. They didn't care about bad nor good. They wanted, so they took. It was a lot like Krauser himself. Krauser didn't care about whether his actions were right or wrong. He only cared about his own benefit. If that hurt or helped others, he didn't spare a single second of thought towards it. This necromancer was the same, and that is what scares me. There is so much good and evil in the world, and sometimes things happen for no reason at all. So although I wasn't in every factory, and I don't know everything that happened to everyone, I do know that I fear a world ruled by people like Krauser, people who only care for their own personal benefit and who do not care for kindness nor cruelty, who will do whatever it takes for their own benefit. I wouldn't know how to appeal to such a mindset. And last night, I saw what that very mindset is taken to its logical conclusion. Both Dexter and Sinestra would live long lives, and they would share their own story to anyone who listens, and it is widely agreed that ultimately justice was done that night. However, it is important not just to look at the modern tales of Father Christmas bringing children to life, and to also look at the oldest part of the tale and realize that justice was provided by someone who couldn't care less about the concept of justice. The necromancer has done good and has done bad. Ultimately, he doesn't care about such concepts. He doesn't bother with higher concepts like balance, chaos, order, or death. There is his benefits and his detriments. A powerful man who was practically a villain to everyone in the city of Nova. He didn't know and he didn't care. He would have just as easily cut out the stomach of a saint or a powerless homeless man if it had what he wanted. It is important to understand things like this, because some of the worst villains in the world aren't out there to do evil. They care about what they care about, and nothing else. They care about their benefits and their detriment. They do not care about what harm they do to others, they see people as objects, and because of that, they see no sin in their actions. 
when people like this do something good for someone else, even if it looks kind or, or just, it doesn't make them a kind person, regardless of a single action. Remember this, not everyone who gives gifts are saints, nor are they necessarily even a good person. Consider who is giving the gift and where it came from, especially since not every gift given was ever meant to be a gift.